We're about ready for our third speaker of the day. And at this point, I'd like my colleague, Carolyn Dober, professor, professor of mathematics and computer science here at Gustavus to come up and introduce our speaker, Dr. Marcus Feldman. Thank you, Tim. With admiration and respect, I am honored to introduce Dr. Marcus W. Feldman, Burnett C. and Mildred Finley Wolford Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University, and Director of the Morrison Institute for Population and Resource Studies, also at Stanford University. Dr. Feldman began his higher education in the land down under receiving a Bachelor of Science with Honors in Mathematics and Statistics from the University of Western Australia and a Master of Science in Mathematics from Monash University, also in Australia. Stretching his wings, he ventured to the Golden State in the Northern Hemisphere, receiving a PhD in Mathematical Biology from Stanford University. Like the many eucalyptus trees that have taken root on the beautiful Stanford campus, Dr. Feldman seems to be a permanent and tra happy transplant there, though he has ventured abroad for a visiting position at the University of Tel Aviv, as well as the University of Chicago here in the Midwest. Through mathematical and statistical models, Dr. Feldman's scientific contributions have enhanced and enriched the understanding of the relationship between genetics and evolution. His distinguished research bridges many disciplines, including genetics, evolution, mathematics, statistics, computer science, population studies, behavioral science, and cultural anthropology, to name a few. His work has been published in numerous scholarly journals, such as Theoretical Population Biology, Heredity, Genetics, the Proceedings for the National Academy of Science, the journal Science, and the journal Nature. Reviewing his extensive, and by extensive I mean over 300, and impressive publications, I noted that although many were technical and specialized, interspersed throughout were papers with titles such as these. Why is stress so deadly? An evolutionary perspective. Heritability of IQ. The meaning of race, genes, environments, and affirmative action appearing in a law journal on the making of an assemblage of stone tools appearing in American antiquity, and my favorite, appearing in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, behavior-dependent context for repeated plays of the prisoner's dilemma. In recent years, Dr. Feldman has been actively researching the cultural and evolutionary effects of China's one-child policy. His research earned him the privilege of attending the Beijing Olympics at the invitation of the Chinese government. Dr. Feldman has authored and co-authored several books, including the pioneering work, Niche Construction, The Neglected Process and Evolution, hailed as a rare and potentially field-changing contribution to the bi biological sciences. The concept of niche construction is based on the relatively simple observation that the activities of organisms bring about environmental change. However, the ramifications of these changes are complex and wide-ranging. Dr. Feldman's other books include Mathematical Evolutionary Theory and Cultural Transmission and Evolution, a Quantitative Approach. Dr. Feldman has received numerous honors and awards throughout his illustrious career, including being the recipient of a J.S. Guggenheim Fellowship. He has been selected as a fellow in the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the California Academy of Sciences. He has served as editor or associate editor of scholarly journals including Theoretical Population Biology, The American Naturalist, Genetics, and Complexity. In his spare time at Stanford, Dr. Feldman supervises a research group of postdoctoral and doctoral students who conduct simulation and analytical studies of evolutionary processes in four areas. The evolution of complex genetic systems influencing immunity and disease, the evolution of learning, the interaction of biological and cultural evolution, 
and mathematical and statistical analysis of mo molecular evolution. The main web page of his research lab reads as follows. Welcome to the home page of Mark Feldman's lab in the Department of Biological Sciences at Stanford University. Our group uses mathematical modeling techniques in order to study problems in evolutionary biology. This web page follows the punctuated equilibrium model, which explains the period of stasis which currently occupies it. Check the fossil record to understand the anagenesis of this web page from a distant ancestor. Be forewarned, however, that web pages do not fossilize particularly well. I now present to you Dr. Marcus W. Feldman, the third lecturer of the 2008 Nobel Conference, speaking on the history of migration and selection seen through the human genome. Dr. Marcus Feldman. First, uh, can I check that people at the back can hear? Good. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, faculty and organizers of the Gustavus Nobel uh, Conference for inviting me. Uh, it's been really uh, inspiring to hear the first two talks today. And uh, I also want to thank Carolyn and my other minder, Sarah Coles, who made sure that I was on the straight and narrow for my stay here. Um, and I'm going to begin with uh, some uh, advertisements. Here is an advertisement for the car genome that I found in the, in the United Airlines Hemisphere magazine, which is uh, I won't tell you uh, how often it, that is cited in the scientific literature, but um, it tells you up there how BMW has got the right genome for a car, and uh, the Jaguar has a good genome for a car. Um, I'm not sure if you talk to mechanics, you'd find the same level of agreement, but uh, nevertheless, the idea behind this ad is the determinism of the genome and that uh, once you know something about the manufacturer, you can rely on nothing going wrong. Of course, we know a lot better than that now. Um, and when we talk about genes today, we really should think back 150 years in 2009. It'll be the 150th uh, anniversary of the publication of The Origin of the Species. And there are at least 150 conferences planned to honor that date. But for those of you who are interested in the human sciences, I think this book, Darwin's uh, 1871 book on the descent of man and sexual selection, is actually more informative about his views on how humans evolved. One of the questions that he posed at that time was how many races there are and you can see that he documents from the literature that he had available to him that there were as few as two and as many as 63. And he, he goes on to say, this diversity of judgment does not prove that the races ought not to be ranked as species, but it shows that they graduate into each other. A theme which actually uh, echoes throughout his writings that uh, those kinds of differences are not really meaningful uh, in most contexts. On the other hand, perhaps the greatest natural historian and geneticist of the 20th century, Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, was very uh, influenced by the organism that he worked on, which was not nearly as sexy as humans, but much easier to keep in the laboratory, and that's uh, fruit flies. And um, the particular species that he worked on, uh, Drosophila pseudo-obscura, uh, is very variable with respect to a class of uh, variations that uh, Svante referred to on chromosome 17, inversions, where the whole genome uh, 
is turned around and works the opposite way. And in each of the different places where he studied fruit flies, he found this inversion to be, these inversions to be different. And that led him to say that geographical races are populations of species that differ in the frequencies of one or more genetic variants or alleles or chromosome structures. Now all of these uh, dr different Drosophila pseudobscura that he captured in Pikes Peak or Chiricahua or in California or in Texas, they were all interfertile. They weren't species at all. So the question then remained, what is it that, that this is? Now, Svante told you a little bit about the DNA. I'm gonna tell you about two different kinds of variation that occur in the DNA in almost all eukaryotes, that is, organisms above the bacteria, including fungi, through to humans. And the first class of variation that I'm gonna talk about is called microsatellites, or short tandem repeats. And our human genome, which is about, as you heard, three billion nucleotides long, has at least 100,000 places in it where there are different numbers of a specific repeated motif, like this one, CA, CA, CA. So at one of those positions, I happen to be a 24-26 heterozygote. That's because my mother had 24 and my father had 26 at that, pos at that particular position. These uh, particular, this is called a dinucleotide repeat, but there are others which are called trinucleotides that have three nucleotides that repeat themselves, and then there are tetranucleotides that have four that repeat themselves. And they're scattered throughout the genome. Almost all that are uh, the ones we study, every one that we study, is in non-coding regions of the genome, which is most of the genome. It doesn't code for anything that makes anything. And they happen to be the most variable uh, parts of the DNA that we know about. Uh, they have a mutation rate which is very high in the neighborhood of uh, five times 10 to the minus four per generation per site, which is four orders of magnitude faster than the mutation rate in single nucleotide polymorphisms. And that's why these have proven to be useful because they're very, very variable around the world in humans and in other organisms. And the fairly recent journal called Molecular e Ecology, if you pick up any issue of that today, you will see that the focus is most likely in half the articles on how whatever organism is being studied varies in its microsatellite polymorphisms. The single nucleotide polymorphisms were uh, told to you by Svante and this is a particular example here where we just have a sequence like this. I'm going to call it me, but I would have two, two such sequences. One of these is mine, and one of these is yours, and we differ at this position here, and that's called a SNP, an SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. So there are probably 10 million of these in the genome. We don't know exactly how many, <coughs> but uh, after the uh, human Genome Project, uh, people decided, with the blessing of a very large amount of money from the National Institutes of Health, to study variation in three populations, which were the Yoruba, a tribe from Nigeria, Asians, that is uh, Chinese and East Asian uh, Jap uh, Japanese, and uh, Europeans. And the Europeans were a group of people from Utah. Uh, those, three, <coughs> those three populations constitute what you have heard of as the HAP-MAP project. And I'll refer to the HAP-MAP project later on. On the other hand, in 1990, a group of us, uh, led by uh, my uh, beloved colleague, Professor Luca cavalli Sforza, tried to get the National Institutes of Health to support studying not just the human genome, but human genome diversity around the world. And our proposal was that there are probably 6,000 languages spoken around the world, 
Um, and this Human Genome Project is going to study variation in a uh, particular group of people, probably mainly uh, European Americans. And all of these other people in the world aren't going to benefit from that very much. So let's do some expenditure on the rest of the world. And we figured that uh, 5,000 populations and a sample size of 20 each would cost about $25 million, or a tenth of a percent of what the Human Genome Project cost. Um, and everybody refused. So the Human Genome Diversity Project was never funded to any extent, not one dollar. On the other hand, after uh, about 12 years, we were able to convince a group of laboratories around the world who had samples of cell lines that uh, had been sampled from different populations around the world at different times to send those cell lines to a repository in France called the Centre for the Study of Human Polymorphisms, Centre d'Etude Polymorphisme Humain, and there those cell lines would reside and any laboratory in the world could get the DNA from those at cost, which is very cheap. So far, at least 100 laboratories around the world have gotten the DNA from the Human Genome Diversity Panel. So this is the populations where they come from. The advantage of cell lines is that these cell lines go on reproducing ad infinitum, so you don't run out of the DNA, so you don't have to mount another expedition to go and visit the Khoisan people or the Mbuti pygmies. The cell lines are there in perpetuity. So it actually is a bargain. It would have been a bargain had they decided to fund it properly. And as you can see, that there are some very vital parts of the world that aren't represented, like this one. Um, and uh, this part of the world up here is not represented. And there are various reasons why indigenous people from those pla places, and not too much in Europe either, were not represented in our uh, sample. And uh, much of that has to do with politics, which is not the subject of this talk. Um, here is what the sample consists of. It's uh, about 1,056 individuals. There are actually 53 populations, and uh, some of the ones in Africa uh, only have a couple of samples represented, so sometimes we fuse them because they're fairly close uh, in uh, their Bantu populations. Um, we've done an analysis of the data that uh, came in uh, from all of these uh, populations, and of the 1,056, only this many are actually unrelated to one another. We actually found eight pairs of what looked like identical twins, but clearly they were duplicated samples that the people who had sent them into Paris didn't know that they had been duplicated. So uh, using the genetics, just the genetics, we were able to detect these things. And using statistics, we were able to eliminate everybody who was up to a second degree relative from the uh, uh, list that we wanted to study. Now, the markers that you've heard about today, mostly from Curtis and uh, from Svante, most of them have been in the mitochondrion or the Y chromosome. There were some in Svante's talk about uh, nuclear gene genes as well. But I'm only going to talk about genes that are not in the mitochondrion, not in the Y chromosome. And they're called, uh, and they're not on the X for the purpose of what we're going to talk about. You'll see a little bit of information about the X chromosome, which is also special, and you'll see why. So what did we do in the very first study of this kind, working with uh, my students, Noel Rosenberg and uh, John Pritchard, uh, now at professors at the University of Chicago and Michigan? Um, we had these microsatellites studied in all of these individuals. Now, uh, let me explain what these uh, figures mean. Um, we take all of the DNA, and each individual is studied separately, and we get its picture at all 700, in this case here, 783 positions. 
and we don't put a name on where that individual comes from. So that when we do the analysis, we do not know where any individual comes from. We then ask, after we've got all of these individuals here, all 951 of them, and we've typed them at 783 positions, we ask a computer program, which is called Structure, designed by uh, John Pritchard, my, my former student, to tell us what are the most likely divisions for groups of size two, three, four, five, and six different populations in that set of data. So you can view it as a, another more sophisticated uh, cluster analysis if you're in, into statistics. Um, and not only that, but we ask what fraction of, the, of an individual's ancestry, any individual's ancestry, can be located in each of those two, three, four, five, or six groups. Now, to display it, Noah Rosenberg, my, uh, another student of mine, wrote a program called Distruct, which is called Display Structure. And that's what you see here. So across the top here are a list of the continents from which our samples come from. All of these are African. These are Eurasian. They go up to here. We have uh, Europe. Then there's four Middle Eastern populations. These are from Pakistan. Then East Asia, mostly Chinese. And then we have two oceanic populations here. And then five indigenous American populations. Now, after you've done all this analysis, you ask which is the most likely number, K, of groups, and what is the partition that that number produces for you? Remember, this partition was done without knowing where they came from. So the result is that when we use, say, I'm just going to pick this one here, 993 markers, we see that there is a partition right here. This is all of Africa we see a partition here, which is um, Europe. We see a partition here, which is the Middle East. And we see this partition here, which looks as though it's got some pink coming from here, and a very special group coming from here. Then the two populations from Oceania, New Guinea and Bougainville Island, who are Melanesian, and then all of the indigenous American populations separate out. This population here is a very interesting one. That's called the Kalash. They live in the Himalayas, and they believe that they are the ancestors, the descendants of Alexander the Great's army that was isolated in the Himalayas. They have blue eyes and red hair. Um, you can see other uh, groups that have multiple ancestries. Take this group here, this one. It's got three colors in it. It's got ancestry from Europe or Eurasia. It's got ancestry that looks similar to the Kalash. And it's got ancestry from East Asia. That group is the Hazara. They live in, pa in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And how many people have read The Kite Runner or seen the movie? You remember the family that was so to terribly discriminated against? The the Hazara family? That's because these people are the descendants of interbreeding between what happened in the 11th and 12th century when the uh, Yuan dynasty, uh, Mongol uh, armies, came into that part of the world. And as armies are wont to do, left their genes. And you ended up with a mixed ancestry population. The next thin one next to it that seems to be very similar is actually quite different. It's a population in Xinjiang province, which is northwest China, and you've seen it in the news because there were some disturbances just before the Olympic Games. And uh, those people are also Muslim. And they're on the Silk Road. So most likely, their mixed ancestry comes from the fact that they were uh, mating with traders who came through Kashgar and Urumqi on the Silk Road on their way to the um, em empire headquarters in either Luoyang or Xi'an or Beijing. The Americans separate out very clearly 
except these individuals here who are the Maya, and that little blue patch there shows the effect of colonization by Europeans. And you can see the history of colonization is revealed in these kinds of uh, genetic determination. So you can see people moving around the world and leaving their genes as they go. Now when uh, Jonathan Pritchard looked at more markers than just the 783, he took 2,834 SNPs from a limited part of the DNA. He got roughly similar results in the partition, but it's much less clear cut. You can see all this stuff here mixed up. It's a much less clear picture. So we can ask the question, if you go back and take a particular group, suppose you just took this one, how well could you separate the populations within that group? Not just separate the continents, which this is appearing to do, although you, you might not know that we call this Eurasia, Western Eurasia as a continent. How, how well can you separate those? So that's what this picture is supposed to do. And what you can see is that the Americas separate very easily. The different tribes in the Americas separate very easily the different tribes in Oceania. The different tribes in Africa do too, as long as you mix the Bantu people and keep them as one group. And the other people are the pygmies and the San Khoisan Bushmen. They're the hunter-gatherers and these are the farmers, so they separate out. <coughs> if you talk about the Middle East, it's a complete mess. You can't distinguish very much at all we'll be able to see much more about these groups. This one here in East Asia is a Yakuts, which is in Siberia. So it's not surprising that that separates from the rest of East Asia. Europe was hard to do, except as we heard in answer to one of the questions in the last talk, this group is the Basques. So they're genetically different from the rest of Europe. Now, how much variation is there within and between populations or within and between continents? Well, when you work with microsatellites, you find that about on average, there is 5% to 6% of the variation that actually is allocated to between continents. 95% of the variation is not between continents, it's within the populations within a continent. And that's except for the Americas. And the Americas have a much higher differentiation between the different American indigenous groups than any other collection of groups in the world. And I'll explain why later on. But the microsatellites give this picture that 5% to 6% of the variation only is between continents, which is what we would in the past have called races. That's not in any textbook. It's not standard in writing in textbooks that the amount of variation actually between what we call continental races is only between five and 10%. All the rest is within populations. And in fact, the pygmies alone contain half of the variation that you see on the continent of Africa. So if you're going to ask how did this pattern of variation come about? Um, we have to think about what might have happened 120,000 years ago, or as we now estimate, the last recent common ancestor of the people outside of Europe is around about 65,000 years before now. But when the people left Africa, they didn't have boats. So they probably had to go by land. So what we did is develop a scenario where they migrated through the Levant, across Asia, into these parts of the world here, through South Asia, and into Polynesia or Oceania, and across the Bering Bridge into America, into America, and down here to the uh, Brazilian, that we've got two tribes from Brazil who are here. They're hunter-gatherer tribes in the uh, Amazon.
So that's, that's a picture of how migration may have happened. So I want you to focus on this picture here, because when we look at how genetically far apart any two populations are, and plot that against how far apart they are geographically, we find a very nice straight line. Um, this explains about 86% of the variation. So what we see is what we now call the serial founder effect, that as um, our ancestral modern humans left Africa and moved from place to place. In that movement, a sample was taken of what was there before and formed the next population which grew up. Then a genetic sample of that population moved to the next population. And then a genetic sample of that moved to the next population. That would lead to the decrease of variability across the planet from Africa to America. And that's exactly what we see. The lowest variation on the planet is in the indigenous American populations, and the highest is in the African populations, as Fante said. Now, if you do that same analysis and do it between populations on one side of the Himalayas and populations on the other side of the Himalayas, you see two distinct graphs. So this shows you a picture of what geographical boundaries will do in stopping migration, in preventing things from moving, genes from moving from place to place. The Himalayas are one of the most important of the geographical boundaries. Now, um, Carolyn and her group are mathematicians, and I thought that uh, it would be appropriate to show you that this stuff that we're talking about can be looked at from a slightly mathematical point of view. I'm not going to do any sophisticated mathematics. I want to show you a very simple model that explains how this comes about. So we made a linear array in a simulation study of 251 populations, and we designated DIM50 to be Africa. So you could have migration backwards from 50 back to zero, and the other way from 50 to 250. And we looked at simulating 783 microsatellite loci, each with this mutation rate, which was what Zivotofsky and I estimated it to be from a large database. And then we supposed that each population would grow, and most of the students who are doing an ecology course will have seen the logistic growth equation. And so the people grew at this rate with, a rate with a growth rate which we estimated from data on pygmies, demographic data on pygmies that have been published. And when you do that and you postulate that from population 50, a sample of 50 people move in each direction, they go this way and that way, and then they grow up and they colonize at that rate are, after they've grown up, a colonization group moves to the left and another colonization group moves to the right. That group grows up. After they've achieved carrying capacity, then there's a migration factor where each population allows a certain number. In our case, we allowed one individual to migrate to the left and to the right after carrying capacity had been re reached. And then we let the deems reach their carrying capacity and run the simulation for another 400 generations. And we compare our simulation with the data that I just showed you, which we published. In that data, we had a particular drop of heterozygosity. That heterozygosity obeyed this equation, a linear drop in heterozygosity a total fall of about 16% between Africa and the Americas. And so we asked, what parameters give the heterozygosity in Africa to be this much and the drop to give that much? What parameters in the simulation? This is our simulation result. It's almost a perfect linear uh, correlation uh, of uh, average heterozygosity with distance from the origin in Africa, exactly as we see in the data. 
Now this particular graph shows exactly the same features in terms of the amount of heterozygosity in, in Africa, that's Africa there, and the difference between here and here, the drop during that phase. So the best results come in this square here, and in that square here where, where we postulate a carrying capacity of a thousand roughly, and a migration rate of one individual, and a colonization rate of about 13%. That gives us an exact copy of the data that we had from the microsatellites. So this is, uh, came out last week in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. So this is one way in which you can picture what happens when uh, you have a data set which is as big as ours and ask what's a, what's a natural way that the migration of humans would have produced those data? And the, answer is a serial uh, founder effect that operated li rather like this. That's one possibility. It's not the only possibility, but it's a good possibility as humans moved out of Africa. Now I re remind you again about how difficult it was to study these other populations here. And I want to show you something about the Americas because the Americas are understudied in all of these uh, study, uh, genetic studies because we have too few samples. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons underlying it. Most of them are political. Um, and they have to do with the fact that although the indigenous Americans have been studied for diseases, they have not given blanket consent so that you can't study them for evolutionary purposes. So uh, this is a very big uh, restriction on what you can do with samples that exist today. You can only use them for medical purposes. So in our data, we happened to find one allele which was way out of the range of all of the other alleles. This is the frequency of that allele, and this frequency of this allele was found only in the Americas. So we decided Noah, with NOAA to look closer at that allele and this is the red, what you see here, is the red are the places where that allele is found. Now there's five populations in this group of Americas, American indigenous people that we have. And there's a few others that were studied just because DNA samples were available from a long time ago. And you can notice that if you go back into Siberia, you find there and there this allele also. So the only places in the world where that allele can be found are here, here, and in the Americas. Another proof of the origin of the American people across the Bering Bridge. Indigenous Americans uh, have been the subject of another study that we did because we worked with uh, Andres Ruiz Linares from Colombia and he had samples, more samples from South America and was able to get three Canadian samples, Chippewa, Cree, and Ojibwa. And this is what I want to refer you to. This picture here is exactly the same picture that we had before, only what it does is show just how separable indigenous American populations are. That these are the three Canadian populations and we see the Karatiana and the Surui and the other indigenous Amazonian populations splitting off and almost every population in the Americas forms its own genetic entity. And the reason is that they're founded by very few individuals and the stochastic or probabilistic effects of the sampling mean that if you have a very small founder population then the likelihood that the genetics subsequently as that population grows is going to be different from the next population who had a different set of founders is very high. And you can do that very simply as a simulation study in a class and you can show that happen. And that explains why the indigenous American people are so easy to differentiate from one another where other populations aren't. Well, the next step was somewhat larger. Uh, we managed uh, to get enough resources to ask an entirely different question than microsatellites. 
The company Illumina uh, makes a chip. They now make one with a million SNPs on it. This was the 650 chip. So it has 650,000 markers on it. Um, and uh, we were able to get the DNA to be called on 938 of our 951 unrelated, in 952 unrelated individuals. And at the Stanford Human Genome Center, we ran the 650,000 chip on all of these 938 individuals, giving us 1.3 billion bits of data. The result is very striking in that we see the same pattern that we saw before with the microsatellites with the indigenous Americans, Oceania, East Asia. Now, instead of having the Uyghur and the Hazara have origins in uh, uh, two populations, namely East Asia and Pakistan, they have origins in East Asia, Pakistan, and Eurasia, Europe, here. These are the Pakistani populations. These are the European populations. These are all of the African populations. And the Middle East forms a new cluster. And you can see that every single one of these three Middle Eastern populations has ancestry in three places. They've got ancestry from that Pakistan group, ancestry from the European group, and another group of ancestries where they reside. So all of these people have ancestry in three places. So what race would you call them? You wouldn't call them a Middle Eastern race. We never talk about a Middle Eastern race. So if people have ancestry in more than one of these places, what would be the best name to give that kind of uh, phenomenon? Look at this one here. This one is the Yakuts. And the only group that has a large red component, which is the same as the indigenous Americans. So uh, their ancestry and the ancestry of the Americans is common to that extent, about 5%. These ones here, this group here is the Mozabite. This, this one that I'm pointing to here that has red, brown, and green. Mozabite are a Berber-related group in Algeria that were expelled from Middle Eastern countries, as a number of populations were. And they uh, married and mated with North Africans. But they do have some European ancestry in them, too. And the Russians, this group is Russians. And you can see that they also have some affinity with indigenous Americans. Again, the Hazara and the Uyghur show this very mixed uh, ancestry. So these ancestry uh, groups are what I would tell you are the most important things that we should be focusing on. The fact that there is so much mixture, particularly in the Bedouin who live and move across the borders between uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan and uh, other parts of the Middle East and in Israel. Now, the remarkable thing about, our, about the, the amount of data that we have allows you to do something that you couldn't do before, and that is to separate the European populations. What you see here is a principal components analysis. It's another statistical clustering tool. And all of the European populations that we have are here. These are a North Caucasian group called the ADJ. These are the Basques. These are the Russians from our sample. And these are the Sardinians from our sample. No overlap whatsoever between any of them. Now you start to get groups that are a bit closer together. This blue group here are the Orcadians from the Orkneys, an island group off England. And the green are French. And this is the Italians, the blue being North Italian and the red being Tuscan. With 650,000 SNPs, you can do that level of separation. Now, I want to uh, point something out to you. Three weeks ago, two papers came out simultaneously on Europe alone using a 500,000 uh, SNP chip. And they had many more samples than we had, because uh, we had samples from other parts of the world. 
and they were able to separate European populations that were 200 miles apart. So with that many SNPs and with this kind of statistical analysis, you can do a, a finer breakdown of the Europeans and probably everybody else. Now this is an interesting analysis of our East Asian populations and those of you who have uh, connections in China might be interested in this. These groups up here all speak languages that are in the Altaic family, including the Japanese. They're now classified as Altaic. They all are northern Chinese and they all are pretty close to the border with Mongolia. This is a picture of just their uh, analysis and you'll see that up to here, this is the break at Japan and then all the rest are southern Chinese. So the linguistics groups break up. So we see that language is a good barrier too. It has been, that's why originally we wanted to study the 6,000 populations because language has always been regarded as a barrier. This is the Pakistan group, the Kalash. Kalash is here and the Hazara are here. And they separate from everybody else in Pakistan. And if we do exactly what we did before with the microsatellites, but map the heterozygosity against distance from Addis Ababa, we see a correlation of 91%. I think that's pretty conclusive proof that not only do we have an out of Africa phenomenon, but we have a phenomenon of the serial founder effect as well. The X chromosome is a little bit different from the others. When you use the single nucleotide polymorphisms, we see about 9% of the variation is uh, between continents, whereas with the microsatellites, it was smaller than 5%. But the X chromosome gives you around 13%. Now, you might ask yourself, the student should ask themselves, why would you expect to see something more on the X chromosome? The answer is that for every four autosomes, there are only three X chromosomes. So the population size of X chromosomes, because males only carry one instead of two, the males uh, having lost that X chromosome means that the population size is smaller, and if you do your simulation studies, you'll find that the variation between groups goes up as the population size goes down. And this is exactly the rate it would go change if you uh, looked at the expectation. So our conclusions from this are that if you look at enough markers, populations that are closely related can be distinguished. And I'm postulating and proposing, probably talking to a lot of deaf ears, that instead of the word race, we should change that to call, be called ancestry group. One is because of the negative connotations that the word race has had over the history. Race often has a social also and uh, beyond the biological basis. This gets to the anthropological notion of a social construct. And not, not least is the problem of the Middle East where people have ancestry in more than one place. What are you going to call them? You don't have to call them a race because they're not a race. They're more than one. They've got ancestry in several places. So they belong to a different ancestry group. And we can say what ancestry group it is. They have ancestry here and here and here. Um, it could be that these ancestry groups are useful in the association with other information. For example, if you knew that this individual came from that ancestry group, and came from a malarial environment, then you might look for those diseases that are associated with malaria, like G6PD deficiency or hemoglobin S. We also see that self-reported ancestry coincides with the clustering. Everybody that was uh, sampled reported their ancestry and uh, there were no errors in that. The only error was found that when we first did the analysis, we found a European sitting in the group that we called pygmies. And we discovered that the laboratory had mislabeled that sample. 
And we were able to detect that and uh, put it in the right place. So these clustering methods can assign an individual to an ancestry group with high probability, but belonging to an ancestry group doesn't tell you your genotype at all. So that's a lesson to take home. If you belong to an ancestry group, it's not informative about your genotype. It gives you some probabilistic statements, but not what your genotype is. And the final point to take home is that the classical typological variation for what were called races based on phenotypic differences is not typical of the genome in general. And 95% of the genome will be of the kind we just saw. 95% of the genome is in the non-coding region. And that will be typical of the variation patterns that we've seen with people having ancestry in multiple places. Now I'm going to show you a few examples of some uh, tests that we've run of selection on these genes. And this is a statistic that uh, John Pritchard and his group invented to detect those selective sweeps that uh, Svante mentioned in his talk. Now the first thing that I want to show you is a picture of differentiation of allele frequencies. This is the uh, di the distribution of all of the uh, FST statistics, that is, the variation between continents that we saw in our data. And if we look out here, this is what we call the tail of the distribution. Let's get a bit closer look at that. This is this taken over to here, the tail of the distribution. All of these genes here are skin color genes. And all of them are marked by SNPs that we found in our data. They have SNPs that are near the skin color genes. They're not in the genes, they're near the genes. They're so close that there's absolute linkage to equilibrium. So what we see is that those skin color genes in the top at least tenth of a percent of the FST distribution. This is one of them. It's called kit ligand. And it was found, amazingly enough, in stickleback fishes. That gene was picked up as a black stripe in stickleback fishes. And it turned out that that gene controls pigmentation to some extent in humans. In fact, it accounts for about 20% of the difference in dark, dark skin pigmentation between Bantu and Europeans. And this is its distribution around the world. You can see here that the ancestral allele is in Africa, and the derived allele, the thing that mutated from G, which is A, is almost everywhere else, including the Americas. This suggests, with this pattern, as you will now see, that there has been a strong selection for skin color out of Africa. Now, what you see here are pictures, if you can imagine, a rather stiff stick. Not too stiff, but you pick it up in the middle and you ask how much of the stick is going to come up with me and how much is going to bend down. Then what we do here is we look at the single nucleotide polymorphism that marks that particular uh, haplotype and we go 500,000 bases on either side of it and ask how much variation is there on either side of it. And the red tells us that there is none. That what's happening here is the whole part of that 500,000 has been selected up in these populations where you see the red. And in Africa, it was not. And it was only partially selected in Oceania. This is, this is New Guinea. So this is a way of seeing the pattern of selection that was invented by John Pritchard. Here's another skin color one. This was first found in zebrafish. And it shows you about evolution. You find the same exact gene in humans. Like that. Now this is a different pattern. This one is a pattern where the derived allele only is in Eurasia. It doesn't have a high frequency in East Asia and the Americas, and it doesn't, of course, the derived allele is not here. It's here, 
So you see a different pattern that's been selected only there. And we don't know why it wasn't selected in East Asia at all. We have no, re no idea why it wasn't. But when you do the pattern of the haplotypes, you see exactly the same thing. It's not selected in East Asia or America. It's selected where you see the red, red lines. This is a gene that always interests me. It's an EDA receptor gene. And this is uh, one of the causes of the difference between the hair structure of East Asians and uh, indigenous Americans and everybody else. East Asians have a particular structure in their hair. And that's why it makes it so difficult for them to get a perm. And when you look at the pattern of EDA around the world, what you see is that the derived allele is in China, and Cambodia, and in the indigenous Americans, and it's nowhere else. And presumably that EDA has been under selection too, because here are the haplotypes around that gene in all of our populations. You only see it selected here. We have no idea why that gene would be selected. This is a gene we have no idea what it does. We call it C21 open reading frame 34. And this, because we don't know what it is, um, it shows a signal of selection. And in, in this pattern here, the only place where you see heterozygosity is in Africa. Everywhere else, it has very low heterozygosity. And we don't know why. So gradually, we'll pick up patterns of genes like that that we will be able to uh, explain when we learn more about the biochemistry and the biochemical pathways that these genes are involved in. At the moment, a lot of them are like that one, where we have no idea what the selection is. Um, I want to show you one more figure before I stop. This is where we looked at comparisons between the top 10 200,000 base windows of selection in different parts of the world. Orange means you have high selection. Yellow means you have weak selection. And what you see is that we found 10 windows here in the Biaka pygmy that didn't have any selection at all in the Yoruba or the Bantu, and another 10 windows that had selection in the Bantu. This is pretty rare because when you look at the Europe, Middle East, and South Asia, you find a lot of overlap all over those populations. There are about 20 populations in here that don't seem to be very differentiated with respect to selection. And then we find another set of genes, as I told you, East Asia, Oceania, and America. But on the whole, the pattern of selection is such that we can't say that selection is strong enough to overcome those migration uh, patterns that I showed you in the beginning. And the reason I can say that is because for almost everything that we think is under selection, we can't do any finer detail than the continental level. We can't say that this population in that continent is under selection. We can only say that that continental area is under selection which suggests that the migration around the continents, within the continents, has been too great to overcome, uh, to, um, to allow any selection to leave its signature on the data. Um, I want to make a few comments about the uh, social science aspects of, of what we've done. Um, I believe that every single trait that will be studied in the future, whatever it is, will have some association of some SNP with it. That association is likely to be weak, so that the added risk of having the trait will be very small, maybe 2% or 3%. That's what's happened so far with all of the complex diseases, except for a couple. And I think what we have to do as social scientists should be preparing for that. 
because there is going to be found some SNPs that are associated with intelligence. There are going to be some SNPs that vary in frequency between populations. There are already, we know, population differences in gene expression. And that's just one of the quantitative characters that, were, that are important for forming phenotypes. So social scientists must prepare for this. And they have to have ready response teams that will be able to answer the uh, negative uh, statements that are likely to come out as a consequence of these findings. And the way that I propose to do that is we can ask the questions, are there genes that allow correct assignment of geographical ancestry with high probability? And there are, we know them, skin color, hair form, we saw some of them in, the, in those pictures. There are such genes. But when we ask what fraction of all human gene genetic variation lies between and within geographically defined populations, then the answer is five to 15%. And the rest is within those groups. So the underlying assumption that classical typological features are characteristic of the genome in general is wrong. The genes underlying phenotypic differences vary much more between what are commonly called races than to genes in general. We see that there's multiple ancestries in major continents and those migration histories destroy the classical notions of typology. Differences in frequencies between groups are very small on the whole, and no marker perfectly specifies any group. There are one or two exceptions to that. And again, we can infer continental ancestry from the genotypes with high probability, but you can't make the reverse inference. So I claim that for medical genetics, race is a biologically inadequate use of a classification and that ancestry group does better. For example, we know that Tay-Sachs is elevated in Ashkenazi Jews. And that's why most Ashkenazi Jewish couples get tested. But most births of children with Tay-Sachs disease today are in French Canadians. And the reason is that they don't know that they had uh, this gene and they're not tested for it. And the French Canadian population has a very small founder effect, a very small group of founders that were the wives that were proxy brides sent by the King of France to marry the trappers in the 16th and 17th centuries. A very small group of people who had a different mutation in the Tay Sachs gene. Finally, this notion that race is useful for something. In epidemiology, it can be useful primarily for these kinds of social and lifestyle conditions. But ancestry group is a much more useful concept when you come to talk about medically related issues. Thanks. If I could ask our panelists to uh, join me once again for final Q&A session here. If you have questions, please pass them to the ushers. And we'll reconvene here in maybe three or four minutes.
what they think. I actually like it. Yeah, yeah. we have a very the Ojibwe that he's talking about. These are Canadian Ojibwe. I mean, we have Ojibwe here oh. in Minnesota. They were rather later. You know, you know where it would be an interesting right. place to try it would be with cool people who are doing public health. Canadian because they came from uh, and at ASU, we, we have a public health initiative, uh, initiative that's yeah. occurring within the uh, School of Human Evolution. I didn't realize it's it's actually like anthropologists are part of it. But they're anthropologists, they're a strong interest in biology. People like uh, Magdalena Hurtado, I got the first job for work with Yachi. Uh, she worked with Yachi. I would have a big but they're very interested in trying to understand issues of public health image in regards to uh, medical issues. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would take your seats, we'll begin the final Q&A session in just a moment. Our biggest problem is not having any aborigines. I think a lot of our time estimates would be firmed up if we had aborigines. Because using Y chromosome, we can get you know, something like 65,000. But there's this argument oh, that's going on about Aborigines being 40 to 60. How did they get there at that time? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And we went and we spoke to the president of the Torres Strait Islanders and Aborigines uh, Federation, and uh, he, he wouldn't help us. Yeah. Also, it'd be very interesting. All right, let's uh, let's begin here. Yeah. Because that ties right into the issue of the. As is our custom, we'll ask other members of the panel to offer comments or ask questions of Dr. Feldman. I'll start down on this side. Dr. Dunbar looks eager here. <laughs> never look excited, you get caught for a question. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. What I will ask, Mark, is what about sex differences in, in uh, these histories of migration and stuff? So uh, are there any differences between the sort of, well, the, the Alexander's army is an obvious one. <laughs> yeah. Are there more general ones that uh, um, you can point to? <clears throat> one of the ways in which people have uh, analyzed the sex differences in migration is to look at how much variation there is between populations in the mitochondrial DNA, which is transmitted only maternally, and the Y chromosome, which is transmitted only paternally. And uh, the, the data on that are mixed, uh, and generally what we find is that those populations that are patrilineal where the woman moves to live with the man and she migrates, then you see more variation on the uh, Y chromosome and the opposite. And, uh, for our details, for the autosomes and the sex chromosomes, it's very hard to detect from our data differences in the rate of migration. The FST, the fact that the FST value is higher might be only due to the population size effect, not to a differential migration effect, and you can't separate those two. Okay. Dr. Marion. Yeah, I had a question. Um, obviously, missing the Australians is a big issue, um, and also because it's, it's, uh, it's a sample from an entire continent that's in a sense of blank uh, space. Do you think that if the sampling within Africa was increased, that it could potentially have any major effects on the patterning that we're seeing. And the re reason I raise that issue is because we have samples now from many of the hunter-gatherer groups. You talked quite a bit about the pygmies, the Khoisan actually fit in there well. But there are hunter-gatherer groups um, that haven't been sampled yet. For example, the Boney, yeah. which are in southern Somalia. Yeah. Uh, as far as I know, the Okiuk in the mm -hmm. highlands of Kenya haven't mm -hmm. been sampled, or? Um, no, but there, there are literally hundreds of language groups in Africa that haven't been sampled. And uh, some of the uh, companies that uh, pr promised to give you your African-American uh, customer an ancestry in a tribe just don't have the data to be able to do it. Um, just in the Congo alone, there are hundreds of tribes. Yeah. And the 
you know, some of them have been destroyed over the last 125 years since the Belgian uh, colonization. But um, if we had those data in Africa, there would be uh, a gold mine, uh, including not just the Yoruba, which is supposed to represent Africa in the HAP map. Uh, they are the biggest tribe in Africa, and I don't think they really represent Africa. There are 16 million or so Yoruba and 600 million Africans, and um, the rest of Africa um, may be much more interesting than the Yoruba. Maybe just a question about how we should think about these ancestry groups. So when you say in the Middle East, for example, you see three different ancestry groups, African, European, and so when one then says that you, people in the Middle East have ancestry from Europe, should we think about that as migration from Europe to the Middle East, or, or is it that Europe became populated via the Middle East, from the Middle East? Is there a direction in this? I don't think you can, I don't think you can tell. You, you have common ancestry. That, that's what you can, you can say that they join at, at the tree somewhere. Um, the fact that the Levant has been uh, a, a migrating uh, source for so long means that um, migration is a good possibility, but it's not necessarily the case that it's the only one and that they could have had a common ancestor at, at some point earlier. Um, I'd love to be able to do uh, more studies there. Is, isn't part of the problem with the Levant that it's also a sort of focus of an awful lot of military expeditions and you know, so yeah. you've got the coming in the Persians and you know, everybody else coming in from the East, you've got the Crusaders coming in from Europe and so on. So it must be an extraordinary mixture of Thank yeah, you. but there are, some, there are some things that you can do. There's a, uh, a study we did of a group in Israel called the Samaritans. Hmm. Um, most people have heard of them because there was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the Samaritans uh, um, live in two parts of Israel. There's uh, about 320 in each. And they claim that they are the original uh, people of uh, Samaria, the northern part of Israel. And they claim in their histories that in 722, uh, Sargon, uh, a Syrian, came and invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, a lot of the Samarians or Samaritans were removed. If you look in the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles, you'll see differences in, in what they say because one of them says that all of the Samaritans were replaced and that they um, were replaced by people from Central Asia. And the other one says a story about the king in Jerusalem sending a letter to the children of Ephraim and Manasseh who actually are the Samaritans. They call themselves the children of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's son. So, um, in 586 um, BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple and there's the exile of the Jews into Babylon. 520, they come back, they return, and they start to build, rebuild the temple. And the, the S Samaritans claim that they came to the people who came back from Babylon and said, we want to participate in this because we are the ancient people of this land. And they said, no, and you're not even Hebrews. And uh, that political thing, with, in my opinion, and in the opinion of some of the scholars of the Samaritans, is why they got a reputation of being bad. And that why there's the emphasis on the good one in, in, in the Bible, in the uh, New Testament. It turns out that when we looked at the Samaritan DNA, um, they're highly inbred. They're the most highly inbred population on the planet. Um, we, we had great difficulty. We found 12 people who were third cousins. Everybody else was either second or first. Um, <clears throat> we looked at them and found that they actually are very close to the uh, Kohanim, to the Kohans, and in the Y chromosome. So, and the, the, the mitochondria, bear no relationship at all to anything that's in the Jewish populations. 
And their tradition is that being a Samaritan is passed on through the male line, unlike the um, traditional Jewish uh, transmission. So there are things you can tell if you get enough samples of the right people. And you can tell these nice historical stories. Dr. Van Hoistig? Yeah, I was wondering if you could say a little more about a comment that you made twice uh, that belonging to an ancest ancestry group mm -hmm. uh, does not accurately depict an individual's genotype. Could you say a little more about that? Well, it's a statistical uh, problem that an in the fact that an individual is a one, an uh, um, one ancestry group could mean that the probability, even though the probability of him having or her having this much uh, of that ancestry and this much of that ancestry, it doesn't say that he does have that much of that, that ancestry. It could be that the average in that population is 30% of this and 40% and of that and 30% of something else, but any individual could be 70% of the first. Okay. Right. Hello. Question: you, and When you're talking about the serial founder effect, you can say that uh, the people living in a certain place uh, developed a certain signature haplotype of some sort, and then this passed on. Do you have any idea of when this occurred? Um, we actually tried to, in the simulation, uh, one of the parameters that we used was how long it took to get from Africa to America. And the estimate, you know, if you put the common ancestor outside of Africa at 65,000 before now, and then the uh, uh, arrival in the Americas at between 15 and, and 25 before now, that's the figure that we used. Okay. Here's some questions from the audience. How do you think the results of your work would change if you had a larger sample size to work with? Um, I don't think it would change on the... Uh, particular people that we had, if we had more people uh, of each of those groups, what, it, what it, would, it would be very useful if we had more groups and we would be able to fill in a lot of holes and that's a real, you know, it's, a, it's one of the things that we would love to have people, more people contribute cell lines from all around the world, particularly Africa um, and of course Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, Dr. Stanford. Uh, your analysis seems to look pretty good to me in terms of modern humans, uh, but I begin to wonder what would happen to the analysis if we had, for instance, uh, a Paleolithic people from Siberia as well as North America, and uh, perhaps things might change a bit. Um, which Paleolithic people? <clears throat> well, the Paleolithic people, any of the Paleolithic if we, if we had uh, ancient DNA, you mean? Yes, yeah. ancient DNA, yeah. that's correct. Um, I really don't know. I'd, I'd be curious to find out. Um, it would be really nice to know if, if Svante could give us the level of heterozygosity in uh, uh, Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where I was going. That's, that's right. what Svante said. But it seems to me that you're, you're modeling, at least for North America anyway, a mm -hmm. uh, post-Pleistocene. Population movement, and uh, there's many other things that are going on. For instance, your uh, uh, LA that you have in Siberia can be explained uh, simply in the archaeology as, as backward movement from the west coast yeah. in that direction. Yeah. So I begin to worry about the directionality of. of I, I think you, you might explain it as uh, reverse migration, but I think that that presupposes uh, that people do a lot of reverse migration. I don't think there's too much evidence that there's a lot of reverse migration. Yeah, and what about failed migrations? Yep, failed there. You're not gonna see them wherever we're looking, right? right? Partic particularly if you're looking at island geography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I sort of view, uh, as many Native Americans do, uh, North America as an island, Turtle Island. Yeah. And so you can have a lot of things going on here that don't necessarily show up in the later record. Yeah, I think it's a lot of islands, actually. So it's kind of like uh, Oceania on a continent with uh, a lot of drift, a lot of random genetic drift going on, sampling effects. There's another question from the audience. Were there any cultural belief systems that you encountered that made the collection of genetic material particularly difficult? 
Could any of these skewer alter your data substantially? Um, the answer is yes, they were, and they didn't skew the data because we didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, there are in religious beliefs that uh, some peoples have that they cannot part with any part of their body. And we need blood. And uh, that's, in, one is never going to even argue with that. It's when people have a political reason for not wanting to participate in these uh, things that it becomes more, uh, I think, tendentious and, and we, we start to get upset and they start to get upset. Well, this is, relates to a question, uh, one of our internet questions here. Uh, how do you address the ethical implications of finding out people's racial or ancestry groups' backgrounds? How do we guard against the ability to determine race for being used <coughs> for inappropriate, non-scientific reasons? Mm -hmm. Well, that's why um, I've suggested several times in several places that there should be, among the human genetics community, uh, and the social science community, a ready response team that should be there like uh, Obama's responses to everything that uh, McCain throws at him, that there should be a, a ready response team to respond to those uh, nefarious claims that you'll always see popping up. There's sort of a cyclical effect. I think it's a 25-year cycle that you'll have these extremely racist things coming uh, around, starting, you know, we, we had this uh, Jensen Shockley thing, and then 25 year, years later, you have um, the, the, um, the bell curve, and then uh, we'll get another one fairly soon. Mm -hmm. but, so I think that there should be a team of people, including psychologists, including statisticians, and including geneticists, who should be prepared to answer such things. Can you maybe build on one other thing that you had here before? Can you comment on any instances where genetic information uh, perhaps confirmed cultural myths or stories of some sort or another? Well, the Samaritans was, was one. Um, can't think of, uh, I can't think of any offhand. Other than that one, can you, Robin? No. <laughs> I, I, I thought you were doing some work on, no, no, no. on in Iceland on the. You can. That's just historical. That's just Kalash. The, the Kalash is one. Yeah. Kalash. Santi mentioned the Kalash is one. But but what about things like the parallelism between linguistic trees and, and genetic trees? The phylogenetic tree that you make from data like ours or data like mitochondrial DNA and uh, seems to be, except to, for some places like Ethiopia where we know there's a problem of migration, that the linguistic tree made on Greenberg's word list fits very well with the genetic tree. Okay. Well, I think I'll close with one last question from the audience here. I'm not sure they were completely serious. What do you think would happen if you did a sampling of the population here at the Nobel Conference? <laughs> um, I, I think they'd all go home with a little plaster. <laughs> um, actually, there was a study done of Americans uh, by uh, Neil Rich at Stanford of uh, Asian Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, African Americans, and European Americans. 4,000 people associated with the Kaiser uh, Permanente Health Group. And they were able to uh, say, using 387 microsatellites, they placed everybody except five individuals into their uh, ancestry group. Okay. All right. Well, we've had a wonderful day, ladies and gentlemen. Had three great speeches. Do give them a hand. Can I also remind you that at 6:30 this evening, our session on the peopling of Minnesota will take place right here.
This will be at 6.30. Dr. Scott Anfinson, our state archaeologist, will speak about Paleo-Indian sites, and Guy Gibbons from the University of Minnesota will talk about archaic Indians and woodland Indian sites here.